Well, welcome to you. My name is David. I have the privilege of being on the teaching team here at Vital Point Church, and I'm also our Exeter site leader, and today is a great day to gather. So I'm glad that you are here this morning or wherever you are at right now. See, we're in a series right now called Vitality, and and we do this series every year. And the series is designed each year to keep the vision, mission, and the kingdom assignment close to the minds and the hearts and the souls of people that call this place home. Ron, our lead pastor last weekend, was very clear with his messaging that we want to be a church that continues to move outward, have an outward focused heart, an outward focused mind and direction to all of the things that we do here at this church. Um, too many times in our world right now, especially in our Western society or Western culture, churches have turned into this seven day family reunion. Like every Sunday they get together and there's insider language and insider moments and people that come for the very first time maybe a guest because they searched them up and found them because they're looking and searching for answers to life. They come into the space and they don't really feel seen or welcomed or known in these moments. And we as a church truly have a heartbeat that goes the other direction. Uh, We want to reach those who haven't encountered Jesus yet in their life, who are maybe pondering the questions of life or or, are trying to discover truths to how to walk in a life. Or we want to reach the people that have maybe walked away from faith or church and Jesus because of a moment in their past, but they're now softened to exploring these truths again. Now, if you're newer to Vital Point Church, uh, this is a great time to be part of a discussion through a series like this because you're gonna gain wisdom and understanding and have a true look into the heartbeat of this church. It's helped myself and many others actually gain the wisdom and clarity of where God is leading this ragtag group of people called Vital Point. And we wanna ask, will you attach your story to the story of God? So let's look at the mission. Let's look at the vision and the kingdom assignment. We're all gonna get tattoos after the service. They're setting up the tattoo booth wherever you are gathering. I'm just kidding. We don't believe in tattoos at all. Um, I'm just kidding with you guys. Let's look at the vision, the mission, and the kingdom assignment. The mission is to point people to Jesus and walk with them as they become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Jesus was very clear in Matthew 28 that we must go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, Jesus even says to the church, the early church, that you will be my witnesses. And we as a global church, but also as a vital point expression of the church, we don't mess with this mission. We really truly hold this clear to actually take steps forward towards people, not just wait for people to come around. The vision of the church is to be a multi-site church that reaches thousands of people who are exploring and growing in their knowledge of Jesus and commitment to his church. We really understand that the mission of Jesus is actually achieved through living this vision statement out in all of our lives. All of us have people in our lives that are maybe exploring and growing. We hold these two words really close to our being to know that if we are to explore these truths or invite people into this process of walking in faith, we all need to lead ourselves and others, investing and inviting them to that process of walking in faith in community. That's why we love the reaching thousands because we believe at some point we will look at this vision and know that God has fulfilled the vision through our obedience. Now, the kingdom assignment is beautiful, short and sweet, to plant churches in small towns. This comes from the life of Christ. And if you don't believe me, you can actually see this moment in his life with his friends when they approach him from Mark chapter one, verse 38. Let us go to the next towns. I've been amazed by that little phrase right there. Let us go to the next towns. He's actually inviting them into the process of the assignment that he's been given by God. He goes on to say that I may preach there also, for that is why I am. Cain. Jesus spent most of his time in towns in the region of Galilee. And uh, the question we've been asking a lot lately is why focus on small towns? Because the real reason is the need is great in these towns. Uh, Jesus actually focused on those who were hurting, who were broken, who were vulnerable, and who were desperate for healing. And small towns that we may live in right now or are in a region of small towns, they, they, they have big problems. 
And Jesus actually wants to address those problems through his body, which is the church. See, small towns are not the Hallmark movie that they're all made out to be, right? We've seen the movies around cheesy like Christmas times and and it's just really interesting where they're made out to be this like beautiful, always put together kind of towns. But the reality is there's people in these towns that are broken and hurting and truly need to be seen and known. And churches are, and small towns are closing like crazy. And what's unfortunate is that it is true. It is happening. There's a lifespan to a church. But we believe in small towns, what we're seeing as we step into the obedience of our kingdom assignment, that there is a little flame flickering there. And we wanna be part of turning that flickering flame into a blazing light that actually shows that God loves these small towns so deeply. So vitality this year, We've been looking at how do we actually step into these moments? How do we see ourselves actually walking in these things? So we've been looking at Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 13. It says this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul the writer here, uh, who has been writing to the churches in the surrounding area of Ephesus, talks about that Christ gives us the church uh, gifts to build up the church and to reveal who he is in the world. Last week, we opened up teachers and shepherds and how they're a key piece to the puzzle. Today, we're gonna explore evangelists because evangelism is one of those gifts Paul mentions about in Ephesians chapter four. Now, I wanna be very clear here. I don't want you to think like, well, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not wired like that. I don't wanna do that. I, I, I don't, you're not off the hook here, okay? I want to explore a, a twofold approach, the gifted evangelists and the evangelistic believers, because we are all called to walk in this responsibility of revealing the glory or the good news of Jesus. Um, and he's called us into that. And that's the question that I really wrestled with this week is, does Jesus actually call us to carry the good news? And if he does call us to carry the good news, how can we really live questionable lives that makes a difference in the regions that we live? And do we actually have the power from God to reveal his glory and his wonder? Okay. And if evangelism is a part of that, we need to look at this. If Jesus is truly calling us into this. Now evangelists, they can be described as this enthusiastically recruiting others to a cause or are called to enlist people to proclaim in the good news of Jesus Christ. They, 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 they carry the responsibility, in other words, to encourage and to unite the church body to live these things out and share what Christ has done for the world. These people are gifted and they are able to inspire others to live out their faith, their, their faith as normal as it is to post a picture of the food that you ate at a restaurant, right? How easy is it to just be like, I've loved this food so much. People need to know the good news of this quesadilla that I've had at this Mexican restaurant, right? And if you haven't posted publicly what you've eaten online, I know that you've probably done it in your close friends list, right? But it's so easy to share the good things that we have in our life. And evangelists are called to equip the church and the body to know that it is a normal thing for us to share the good news that we have received. Now, when we look into evangelism and the depths of it, like I said, you start to see a twofold approach. And the first side of that approach is the gifted evangelist, where these people have story upon story of random, crazy, weird, maybe sometimes awkward moments where they have an opportunity to step in through a door or a window or wherever it is to share the good news of Jesus. And I sometimes find it amazing to watch gifted evangelists be in the same room because they talk about their stories and it's like they're trying to one up each other. But what's really happening is they're glorifying God of how they use them, right? And they are gifted to do this. And it is an amazing gift to have to share the good news anywhere at any moment at any time with anyone. Now, the other side of the approach is the evangelistic believers. Now, many, many people sit on this side of it. Of the, of the approach to evangelism, where you may question like, 
God, I, I, I'm not actually gifted like this. Are you really wanting me to do this? Can I actually really live out my life? Am I supposed to be the, the, the Billy Graham of my generation? Am I supposed to be the George Janko of podcasters or even the Bryce Crawford of going into meetings and talking with people about Jesus? Now, the last two names you may not know if you're over the age of 30. If you're under the age of 30, you probably know who they are. But evangelistic believers often wrestle with the tension, does my life actually make a difference? And I think we need to today truly look at the depths of this twofold approach. So let's look at the gifted evangelist for a second. Because the wild thing is, God knew he needed to instill or wire people to become enthusiastic about spreading the good news. They, they, they just have a passion for it. It brings them joy and excitement and they're looking for opportunities where it attracts people into the beauty and into the wonder of who he is. It it just draws them in with their life that they live. And Ephesians 4 talks about this, that there are gifted evangelists. They have a special ability to proclaim boldly the good news of Jesus Christ. But what's unfortunate in many cases in our world right now is that churches haven't done a great job of equipping these people appropriately with this gift to live with confidence and actually live with humility to step into this moment where God has led them to partner with him. The church today has so many gifted evangelists laying and sitting dormant and not living into this beautiful gift that he has wired them with, that they have received from him with their faith in him. And see, at Vital Point Church, we're believing right now as we do a series like this or have other moments within the church where we have opportunities to share and to love and to live these things out, the good news that many gifted evangelists will actually have their wires kind of jolted and shocked into alignment with what God has placed inside them where they are stirred to walk in these good things that he's placed inside of them to reach people far from him. It's amazing when a gifted evangelist has the light go off because they see everything different. There's a beautiful guy in the, in the New Testament named Philip. I don't know if he's beautiful. He might've been ugly, ugly as sin, but he's a beautiful guy because he was actually a gifted evangelist who walked with Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was one of part of the core 12 and Jesus wired him and gave him and God gave him the gift of evangelism. See, after Jesus ascends into heaven and says to the early church, I will send you the power through the Holy Spirit, where then you will be my witnesses and live out the good news. Philip actually has a moment where he is encouraged by his community to go do these things, but he's also tapping into, God has gifted me this way to live like this. And he goes to a place called Samaria and watch this people group as they respond to him being a gifted evangelist. Acts chapter eight, verses four to eight, it says this. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. This is encouraging to us. They're actually living out the mission of Jesus. Uh, Matthew 28, go and make disciples. They were scattered about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ or the truth, the way of life, who is Jesus. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Verse eight, so there was much joy in that city. As I've been reflecting on this particular section this week of looking at Philip and his life, and keeping in mind the gifted evangelists, that they have a wiring to do these things where they will see God move through them, I found myself envisioning how Philip would have relied on God through his efforts. He decided to show up. He decided to believe in the power that Jesus said that he would have inside of him by believing that God was going to reveal himself through his Efforts. Verse six is actually very interesting because it describes the crowd as being rallied together with one accord and they paid attention to what he had to say and what he was doing with his life. In this moment, he would have had the confidence and the humility of Christ who sent him to do this work. 
He was living this out because he knew the assignment and the gifting that God had wired him with. He was building up the church and revealing the power and the glory of God through his efforts because they uh, would have had this moment where they would have been drawn into the attractiveness and the beauty and the reality of who he was as a human being, but being able to do these signs and wonders and miracles through preaching and living out the gospel as a gifted evangelist. They were drawn in. And in verse eight says that the community was filled with joy. The Holy Spirit and Philip completely interwoven themselves together and allowed the glory of God to reveal what was going on in the kingdom of heaven, the good news. See, what I've come to realize with evangelism is this. Evangelists are in the business of pointing the attention away from themselves and more interested in pointing to the one who gave them life. They don't say, look at me. They say, look at the one who gave me life. And so can you, you can have what I have. See this people group that Philip was interacting with They were consumed with feeding their selfish desires. They were actually known for practicing dark magic. They were also into uh, uh, trying to attain worldly possessions, serve their personal satisfaction and success. What can I get? What can I receive? What can I do with my life? And, And doesn't that sound a lot like our small towns in the regions that we live in right now? We have many people flirting with the darkness of this world. We have many people seeking uh, worldly satisfaction and worldly success. And and we're not very different from the area and the region of Samaria. See, Philip was proclaiming and revealing the power of receiving life through the one who created life. He would have identified with them and they would have identified with his story of the personal brokenness of who he was as a human being and then being brought life. How are you doing these things? They would have asked. Gifted evangelists point away from themselves and point people to Jesus through the power and the wonder. They carry the responsibility to proclaim this good news that has come for all. And yes, I say responsibility because God calls his church to step into specific times and to specific moments and with specific people to showcase who he is. He's not some puppeteer trying to push and poke and prod at, uh, uh, at the church, the body of Christ. No, he's inviting us in to carry and to contribute in the reconciliation of this broken world. And see, we've been praying boldly, not just praying, praying boldly that many gifted evangelists would know the call that they have on their lives, the gift that God has instilled in them so that they may live into those moments to reveal who he is by just showing up, truly believing that there is power and wonder of God dwelling inside of you to show the world that there is good news to be received. Don't quench the spirit of God that is living inside of you. He wants to be set free through your efforts. And in your obedience and in the stirring of your heart for others to reach people. And as you step into those moments and ask God to give you moments, you will have the eyes and the ears to see, I must be obedient to reveal the glory of God to these people. That's the first side, gifted evangelists. And we're praying over you if this is you and your heart is stirring up. But there's another side to it, evangelistic believers. Now I mentioned many of us actually sit on this side of being an evangel- uh, a gifted, evangel- uh, aren't gifted evangelist, but are evangelistic believers. And Jesus calls us to witness to the world, no matter what, through our belief and through our faith of our everyday lives. Now, some of us, this scares the living crap out of us. Some of us are shaking in our boots and then we're chairs. And we're like, no, 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 I just wanna leave. I don't, 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 don't talk to me, don't talk to me. But some of us, are starting to warm up to this as well. The stepping up, like having the idea of actually stepping up and actually asking God to reveal these moments to you because you're gonna trust God that he will give you the power and the wisdom to do these things. I noticed this uh, last week, actually, as I was walking to church, I find myself walking to church on Sunday mornings because the team is doing a great job getting things ready and I'll be able to uh, walk to church and pray. But I found myself this particular Sunday morning, um, a week ago, uh, really speaking down on myself 
I wasn't speaking words of life into my, into my world. I wasn't caring about myself really. Um, and I was beating myself up. And I, don't, I believe no matter where you are with God, faith or life in general, we often all do this. We, we don't often reflect on the goodness that we can speak over ourselves because God says, I sing a song over you. I love you so much. This is how I see you. We often use a broken damaged lens of how we see ourselves. And see, when it comes to being an evangelistic believer, I believe nine times out of 10, we actually don't truly believe that that our life matters. And we don't actually have the confidence that our lives could actually change the world around us. And it goes back to the original question. We actually don't believe Jesus asked us to carry this good news. It was more of a suggestion. Like if it works with your life and if your calendar and in the area, if it works with everything, then you can do it. But Jesus actually calls us to truly care carry this good news and actually hold it with a responsibility of love and actually a gift to give to others. See, many evangelistic believers make excuses. Well, God hasn't wired me like this. I guess I'm off the hook with this one. Or we say, thank God he hasn't wired me like this because I don't wanna be in weird, awkward situation like the gifted evangelist. But I believe we can't sell ourselves short on what our everyday influences can be and do. I, I, I believe that he's actually called us and the Bible says that he's called us to allow the kingdom of heaven to be here on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're praying as a church, may your will be done, God, that means that we are actually partnering with him in the things that he wants to happen in this world. And it says very clearly in his word, the Bible, that every tongue, every heart shall confess. That is his desire for all of us to reveal the glory of who he is through his son, Jesus. Now, Michael Frost, an incredible communicator and author, talks a lot about how do we surprise the world? He wrote a book on this and he encourages all believers to embrace a lifestyle, say this again, a lifestyle of evangelism through our everyday. And how he encourages people to do this is through simple moments that we can all live into every day because we all have opportunities. As you lift up your head off the pillow, you have an opportunity to encounter the living God and to reveal others to that glory of who he is. Frost says that if you just took the simple approach of being marked by generosity, marked by hospitality, a spirit life, a spirit led life, you would reflect Christ like character. And he's very clear that it's not about being a gifted evangelist all the time, even though there are gifted evangelists, we are all called to live out this kingdom assignment to make Christ known through our actions and our words. And I believe if we all just tapped into this a little bit, we would see that small flicker in our regions and small towns turn into a blazing flame because there's more than just one person doing it. Generosity, he says. I've started to really wrestle with this in my own life and I'm starting to believe with all of my being that generosity reflects the grace of God and demonstrates the character of Christ. When we find beauty in giving ourselves away, whether it's our time, our resources, our care, or we're, dis we're, we're, we're displaying the gospel in these moments. And I'm not calling you to be a religious or faith-filled doormat where everyone's just walking all over you and you're just so generous and you're actually just being beat up. I'm, I'm asking you to actually see moments where you can simply offer a neighbor some extra time or be generous with your time in other areas in conversations, not focusing on yourself but actually focusing on the needs of other people. And I've had the privilege of watching one young man in our Exeter community the last little while see generosity as his way into people's homes of sharing the good news. His business has been booming because he's been actually opening up his life in generosity where these stories that he shares with me sometimes sound fake, but I'm reminded in Matthew chapter 19, it says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And he wants to use our generosity and he wants to partner with our generosity to show how generous he is as a loving father. So maybe we be marked by generosity with our evangelistic belief that every day we can encounter him and reveal to others. Now, hospitality is a beautiful one as well because it's not just about having people over for dinner, which I love. So invite me over. I love free food and I love watching people cook. I'm not a good cook, but invite me over. Please to enjoy your food. But it's not just about being around a dinner table. It's actually about opening up your life to others. See how generosity and then hospitality actually come together here? Hospitality has the beautiful way of breaking down barriers and inviting others into a place where they can counter Christ's love. Often, 
We've, I've found in experiences when I get invited into people's posture or presence, when they have hospitality on the forefront of their mind, I actually see, I actually find myself being seen. I actually find myself being known. I actually find myself being cared for. And see, deep down, all of us have been wired to be seen and to be known. Yes, truly by God, but also by the people around us. See, Jesus was hospitable with his life. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus was walking through Jericho and there was a massive crowd around. And in the crowd, he picks out one little dude named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was a thief. He was stealing from people. And in this moment, Jesus decides to open up his life in hospitality of just space in general and calls him down and says, Zacchaeus, I need to spend time with you. And in that moment, as they spent time together, he actually revealed to Zacchaeus where he was wrong, where he was doing things out of selfish desire. And Zacchaeus' world was completely blown apart in all the right ways because then his life was put back together of how can I also do this for others like Christ has done for me. And the people were also seen and known through Zacchaeus's life of obedience, of being hospitable. An evangelistic believer, seeing every moment as a moment to reach someone. Now, Christ-like character, this is another thing to be marked by, but it can be described as the fruit of the spirit, right? Being formed in you and I through our obedience of God. Asking him every day, God, I wanna be more like your son. I wanna walk in the ways of the truth that he has asked us and called us to do. And when you do that, whether you stumble or fall or walk really good in it, you will see that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the Bible says against such things, there is no law. See, these characteristics of Christ often speak louder than words and people then notice how we are living differently. And that difference points to the light of Christ that lives through us. See, we should be soaked. We should be immersed. We should be asking God every day that how can I consider to embody this Christ likeness every day in all daily situations and interactions? See, we can't sell ourselves short. We can't. Our Christ-like characteristics change every single room that we enter into. I've been thinking about this for myself and our family, Hannah and the girls and I. Well, like I, I've been thinking about now that Tatum's at school when the, we're going up to the line and it's like chaos and it's like, holy smokes, you're praying for the teachers, right? And when we get to this chaotic line and kids are crying and parents are like, just get out of here. Like how do we as a family carry the love and the joy and the peace and the kindness so that they would see our family for the faith that we have in Christ? I've been thinking about the dressing room at hockey that with the guys that I play on Sunday nights. How can I carry the peace and the love and the joy into that dressing room where I'm sitting with a guy on each side of me and we're talking about life and faith and um, not a lot of faith is talked in dressing rooms, let's be clear, but I'm praying and trusting that I can bring the faith aspect into those places. So when the guys open up about work and the farm fields and what's going on in marriage or the kids that I could just be that moment where I'm hospitable and I'm generous and I'm speaking words of life into them. See, these characteristics that are formed in us draw people into the beauty and the wonder of Christ. It's the upside down kingdom where people say, what is up with you? And you'd be like, you gotta know the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the last one is the spirit-led living. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is probably one of the most important ones because living a spirit-led life is saying that you are relying on the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and power. The Bible talks approximately about a hundred times or over a hundred times about do not be double-minded. It means don't be in this world and in the kingdom of heaven. You can only choose one. And Christ said, fix your eyes on heaven. See, when we are living by God's power, by his spirit and sensitive to his promptings, you'll find yourself having eyes and ears to see what he is doing around you and he's doing in you. Let me share a story with you. Not too long ago, I was painting a lady's home in the area that I live around Exeter and a friend hooked me up with a side job. And I really love these side jobs because it's extra cash and being able to purchase things for our home and, and, and support the family. And it was such a great little side job, bathroom, hallway, quick, easy, in and out. And the best part about my job is uh, my buddy 
because I know him, he kind of gave me a layout what the job looks like. And uh, he said, guess what? They, you won't really see them too much. It's great. Awesome. Um, so they're not going to be in your way. Um, and if they are home, they're going to be consumed by work. I was like, okay, perfect. But for some weird reason, he also said, hey, just want to let you know that they had a son pass away many years ago and um, it's been rough for them in the community that they live in. And I said, okay, great. So I go in the first day and no real interaction really. It's just like, hey, here's the job. Awesome. Thanks so much. And I worked the first day. It was great. Um, the second day comes around and I'm, I'm praying and I'm weird like this. Whatever job I get on a side, on the side job, I'll pray for the house and the family and also pray for the person that got me the job. And I'm praying and I can remember the sitting in the stairwell, helping the, uh, uh, painting the, uh, the, the stairway. And I remember praying for the family and all of a sudden I had this impression in my heart to call the wife upstairs to tell her that the pain that she's carrying right now still with the loss of their son many years ago, Christ knows exactly how they feel. And he wants to offer healing to her. And I'm sitting in the stairway and I'm like, no way, God, am I ever going to call this woman up to tell her this? She'll think I'm crazy. I said, God, I'll pray that you would reveal that to her in another way. So I go on, I start praying that God, may you reveal to her that there's, there's pain in her life and that you want to take care of it. And the impression upon my heart of continuing to call her up is still there. I can't get rid of it. And I'm starting to realize, okay, God, this is really you. This is not something else. So what do I do? I call my wife. I get upstairs. I lock myself in the bathroom. I call my wife. She's got the gift of discernment. So we really figure out this is of God. But she says something beautifully. Actually, you know what, David? Tell her at the end of the job. So if it goes really bad, you can run for the hills. I love my wife. She's always got the plan. So I was like, okay, great. So the job's going on. I'm praying, God, give me an opportunity to speak to this woman. But if it's not your will, let it go. And uh, I'm gonna do this at the end of the day, God. And at the end of the day comes and all of a sudden I hear her, the wife on the phone on a conference call for work. And it sounds like she's making big decisions. And I'm like, great. So I start cleaning up really fast, trying to get out of there because this is my sign. God, it's not actually gonna happen. This is great. And as I'm coming down the stairs with the last little bit of equipment, I hear her on the phone say, I'm done for the day. I'll chat with you on Monday. And I'm like, oh, shoot. God's probably chuckling. This is my sign. So I go upstairs. I quickly say a prayer. God, can you please reveal this to me if I need to step in? I call the wife up. She's like thrilled with the job. I'm like, good, okay. There's one good thing here. And I said, hey, I, I need to tell you something. I'm a pastor and I, have, I believe I have something that I wanna reveal to you that God's spoken to me about. And thankfully she said, yeah, I would love to hear. What, what do you believe God has said to you? And I look her in the eye and I say, um, the loss of your son many years ago, there is pain that you and your husband are carrying. And I want you to know that God knows exactly the pain that you're carrying and he wants to offer you healing. And I'll remember this day for the rest of my life. This woman was weeping and crying and not tears of pain. It was tears of joy. She was finally feeling seen. She was finally experiencing love and peace that Christ could only offer her. And I share this story with you with, because of this, because I too am wrestling with all of these things. I, I, I'm doubting, God, is my life really gonna make a difference? Do you actually have moments that you want me to walk into? And the answer is yes. He calls all of us to live this out. He calls all of us, whether you're a gifted evangelist or an evangelistic believer, to come and partner with him to reveal who he is. Because Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, he says. And as we wrap up today, this is my encouragement. May we all devote ourselves to the advancement of the gospel. Whether you're a gifted evangelist, or an evangelistic believer, because evangelism is not just for the gifted, it is for all who call Christ their savior and their king of life. Our world is desperate for hope, joy, and love, and he's called us to carry that into all spaces so that many will be transformed by the love and the good news of Christ. See, you may be feeling unqualified or unsure, and that's okay. But know and remember, it's not about your ability. 
It's about your availability, saying yes to God. Will you give me the wisdom and the clarity to reveal through my life what you've done for me so that others can have it themselves? See, let's be a church that doesn't just treat Sunday morning like a family reunion. Let's go out with confidence, being spirit-led and filled with the greatest news of all. No one really cares about what you're posting on Instagram when it comes to your food. They are desiring what gives them life. And Jesus has come to bring life, hope, and salvation to a world that is desperately crying out for him. Will you say yes to this? Will you step into this power and live out your faith in a way that draws others to Jesus? The world needs the good news and he's asked us to carry it to them. I hope this has been encouraging to you. And I believe as we tap into this, we will see that small flicker turn into a blazing flame because we're sharing the good news to our love and care for others. Peace and grace be with you.